On the program this week, we're going to be talking about farm accounting. We're also going to be talking about cropping and taking on exactly what is happening as far as their insurance association is concerned and what the brokers are really earning. What people are talking about this week is the Chatham Rock Phosphate share purchase is now basically oversubscribed. The drought continues to bite exceedingly hard, including obviously because of the warm and climate type winter that we're having. Difference between destocking and walking off, yeah, that's an interesting one. A lot of people are talking about headlines that are being used to grab attention. In fact, it's an absolute beat up. There's a boot camp for the farming sector as the government steers towards the export exportations as far as the 2025 targets are concerned. And entries for the Rural Women Enterprising Business opens, and we'll have more about that as time goes by. But in just a moment, it's going to be farm accounting. <music> Kerry, IRD scam, is it still rattling around the hills? Yeah, the one where they're ringing up and threatening the tax avoidance over the phone, leaving a message, getting the call back, particularly Wellington number, is still ongoing. Um, IRD confirmed that they're getting 200 plus complaints a day, still really? coming in, even though, you know, throughout the media, it's been widely publicised that this is a con. Um, they're still getting all these people ringing them up. In fact, I had two clients last week ring me that had voice messages left on their answer machine saying that they were doing, they'd been caught for tax avoidance and to ring and, and pay up, basically. So once again, it's just don't take notice of it, just ignore it. So really, if you get anything like that, ring your accountant yep. or IRD. Yeah, that's what our clients did. Straight away they rang up and said, hey, look, we've had this message, what's going on? And we were able to confirm to them that you know, it was, was not legit. Um, if you don't have an accountant, well, then you'd be at IRD's your, your best port of call and they'll just talk you through it. They need to know what's going on. Um, so when we get a phone call, we report it to them just so they know that it's still going. But yeah, 200 plus a day is still a big number. That's huge. Are, are the police looking at it? Um, yeah, there's, all the phone companies are into it and the police are trying to track things down. Um, you know, they have a Wellington number one day and then it's gone. It's closed down. So the phone companies are on it pretty quick, but it's not stopping them making these calls and, and setting up again and again and again. One would wonder how many people fall for it. Quite a few, apparently. Um, I'm not sure of the exact number, and it hasn't been released. But no, that um, probably won't release. There it has been, it has been quite a few that have been caught, um, and they're actually getting more and more threatening in their nature. When you talk to them, um, they're getting very aggressive, and yeah, it's it's putting a lot of people uh, quite scared. What's the latest with KiwiSaver? Well, we've seen you know a bit of news out there that it's a bit volatile at the moment. Um, and this is a good time for people to actually start thinking about whether they should be in KiwiSaver or if they are, um, what sort of funds they're in. Um, because you know some KiwiSavers have been hit quite hard because of the, the drop in the markets, um, to be expected because of what they're like. Uh, but you know, there's five different fund types and most people are in the conservative fund, which could mean that in the long run for their retirement they miss out on quite a bit of saving. Um, an analysis was done recently where they said over a 40 year period, if you stuck in that compared to some others, you might be 400,000 short compared to some other schemes. But then again, a lot of people will advise you against going into a high-risk one. Indeed, yeah. So you've got to sit down with your financial advisor, um, which is not normally your accountant unless they're a registered financial advisor. That's one of the requirements of legislation. And just work through what, what you are doing, what your goals are, and what stage of life you're at. Because obviously the older you are, the, the less risk you want to take. Um, and just sort of work out where you should be. And, and you, know, you can change from time to time. So you might stay, stick in one scheme for a couple of years and then move over to another. So it's a case of actually sitting down now and looking at it. A lot of people haven't. You know, they've just gone the default conservative and think that's going to work for them. Kerry, a lot of people wouldn't have realised that you can swap and change. You can, yeah, definitely. Um, it's your scheme. You've got the choice. It's just a case of talking to your provider um, or your financial advisor even talking to them and saying, look, this is what we want to do, um, and you can do it. It's, it's your, your money to control, basically. You can't get access to it, of course, but uh, you're allowed to control what scheme you're in. Because I did mine through the SBS. And do I just go into them and... Yeah, you go, and you go to them and talk to them about what, what funds they've got. Um, you know, you've you got your high risk down to your very conservative. So, you know, it might be that you, know, you could be in the sort of a middle type risk scheme. Uh, it just depends on what they think and what they actually offer. You know, everyone's got slightly different variations. So it's a case of, yeah, just doing your research and, and discussing it. Yeah, TAB is not one of those options. No, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> The Court of Appeal, what's... Yeah, um, we had a, a bit of an interesting decision come out from them. Um, mm -hmm. Michael Jeweller had a case before them over tax avoidance. Um, and while not sort of farm related, there's a decision or a, you know, by the Court of Appeal saying that IRD don't have to consistently apply the tax law. 
um, they've come out and said the legislation says it's just that your tax has to be fairly determined um, and according to the law, but the commissioner can change their opinion from case to case if they want. So it doesn't have to be, you know, if you did one thing, the next case has to be exactly the same as yours. They've got free reign, basically, to de determine the law as they see fit. It's Michael Hill's a company, isn't it? Yeah, it's one of the international... And a very big one. Yeah, an international jeweller. Um, and they did a scheme that one, another company got away with it, basically, and they got trapped. They got caught on tax avoidance. So it's a bit of a heads up for people that, you know, don't rely on something that your neighbour might have done, um, thinking, you know, they did this scheme, well, we can go and do that as well. It may not work for you. ID could have a different opinion. Normally, you would think that if a law situation had been passed and everything was okay, that that's now the law. Yeah, everything's open to interpretation, <laughs> um, and it, it's ongoing. Um, you know, we get a lot of questions from clients, and we've got to sit down and look at how the law is, and then you go and look at the court cases, and and you just work your way through it. And it does vary from time to time, and even from office to office of ID. Um, they have little quirks that you know they think one way, whereas another office will think a different way. Makes it bloody tough for people like you as an accountant. Oh, it makes it exciting for us because <laughs> it's a good challenge to sort of yeah you know, interpret that law and present your case to them. Because it the is, truth. It's, it's, an, it's a rule that you are interpreting. Yeah, yeah. So the legislation is sort of the bare bones, and then the case law builds around it, and then yeah, it's sort of what happens in between is what we do. God, you're a lawyer as well as an accountant, aren't you? Oh, part, some of the time, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Gary, thank you very much indeed. In just a moment, we're going to be talking about Holstein Frisians. First up, the breed. Is it in good heart? It is in very good heart at the moment. They, um, there's a lot of positive things happening within the breed with regards to advances in fertility and the efficiency of the Holstein Frisian cow. And um, we're gaining a membership and yeah, going forward nicely. So if somebody wants to get into dairying, why would they get into the black and whites? Um, just because of the efficiency of size, the consistency of breeding, the families, that the Holstein Frisian is the largest population in the world, and just that genetic base that we've got to draw from, so the top percentage is um, a, a very good animal, and, and it's the consistency of breeding uh, good bulls over good cows all the time, and you can get, just get the top genetics through with the Frisians. So looking at the business side, you've got a conference this week. Um, well, the board will meet first and discuss all the, the general business and we'll have an annual meeting on Thursday and at that we've got some discussion papers around promotions and social media and how to use it better and also around um, a, a topic of classification and pointing excellent cows. So it'll be interesting to get the feedback from the membership on both of those topics, they're reasonably topical at the moment. And it's wide open to all members, not just stud breeders. No, it's open to any member of the public who would like to come and join us for a week and see the sights of Canterbury and enjoy the country. And keep the coats on. And keep the coats <laughs> on, yeah. So, yes. So let's go back to the grassroots. I mean, you've got some very enthusiastic members. Oh, absolutely. And particularly within our youth, we've got a very strong black and white youth program that runs within our organisation. We have a uh, youth camp held at the Fielding Dairy event in January each year, where we cover a wide range of topics within breeding of the cows. We've done uh, training of AB or, or looked at AB technicians. We go and visit factories and do the whole, um, whole area of dairying as well as the training of uh, preparing to show a cow and for those because that's a big interest for a lot of our youth of showing calves and there's just a huge number of youth that are involved so that's a, a great atmosphere there. You mentioned social media now your youth have got a very good Facebook. Yeah so one of the drivers for us as an association is to involve our youth more and we see that as through technology um, with the website, social media such as Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, all those things that young people use that I'm not so familiar with some of them, but I am with most of them now. And yeah, that's a good way we see to attract our youth members to participate in activities of the association and become involved. Sponsors, you're allowed to have a commercial. The Holstein Frisian New Zealand is supported by many good businesses and it's too many to list, um, but thank you to them all and particularly thank you to the sponsors of the conference who've supported the local branch in getting this week up and running. Are we still looking at mainly overseas genetics or are we holding our own now? Uh, no, I think it's a combination. We've got a very much our own genetic base in New Zealand. We 
Uh, we're slightly different with the majority of the Holstein Frisians in New Zealand, but we need to keep in touch with the overseas genetics because they're also doing big advancements, uh, particularly in the genomics field, and so that we need to take that into account as well. But it is really about breeding cows for the New Zealand situation is what we need to do. And there is a huge variety in New Zealand of farming situations. So it's not a case of one cow fits all, but within the Holstein Frisian, that's the, the beauty of the breed that there is, you can breed a Holstein Frisian cow to suit every dairy situation. So. And I guess we're now very much working more cleverly rather than harder. Uh, yes, very much so in the efficiency and things are changing all the time, like the scientific research going into breeding and just dairy farming is huge, so it's um, it's working differently. Sometimes, and you talk amongst the breeders, that yeah, there's some, some that don't quite like to hook on the technology as much, but others just love it and sit and ride with it and we've got some really forward-thinking members within our membership. And you don't need to know how it works as long as it does work. It does work, that's exactly right, it's my, that's my role and I make sure that everybody else knows how it works. So yeah, no, it's, it's a great avenue for us as a promotional tool to get the black and white cow out in front of as many people as we can. And we'll have more on the Holstein Frisians later in the programme. In just a few moments we'll be talking to Dennis Carter about cropping. Everybody has a story to tell. What's yours? Maybe your family has been farming the land for five generations. Perhaps you have invented the next best thing in agriculture, or maybe something else. Whatever your story, if you're out on the land, we want to hear from you. Get in touch by emailing us at info at onthelandco.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Aphids. It's been a funny old season. Funny old season, Rob. There's uh, there's frosts and then they stop and it's warm and you know we're getting into the the high teens and uh, of course uh, aphid can grow and do grow at uh, above 5.8 degrees. So they're enjoying it and, and the warmer it is, the faster they grow and multiply. So uh, yes, it, it's potentially a problem out there with uh, with winter sown wheat and and probably um, autumn sown barley as well. Yellow, yellow dwarf virus. Yellow dwarf virus and. Uh, the levels at the moment being trapped are well above 2005, which was a particularly bad season. And uh, we know by our black currents that the chilling, the chilling days or the chilling weeks are a lot lower uh, than they have been for quite a while. And so that's wonderful conditions for aphids. So farmers really need to get out on some warm afternoons and have a look at quite a few plants because aphids do come into the um, crops in patches, mm -hmm. not, not uh, you know, probably a sheltered wind patch. They'll, they'll drop into the paddock there, so if you've got a hedge or trees or things like that and uh, you've got a dominant wind, they're likely to drop in behind those trees. And so that's a good place to start looking, but have a good look and, and go over quite a bit of the paddock because they are in patches. And spray. And spray. Kill them out. Take them out. Yep. Right, but we don't know what else is coming, Dennis, but <laughs> you get into there before. Yes. Um, glyphosate's under the spotlight again. Yes, Rob. Um, there's been a bit of talk about uh, food residues and um, residues from glyphosate in food and uh, certainly if, if people know how uh, glyphosate is deactivated, it's deactivated by um, the iron 
particles in soil. And so effectively, if you were to try and spray Roundup in um, a water that say, say came out of a water race or something like that and was a bit milky, it has soil particles in it. And so it's well known that it doesn't work very well at all because it's uh, deactivated. So basically, this is why Roundup doesn't have residues in the soil. So I don't know where the, um, the residues in, in food are coming from. I think uh, some of that's been dropped. There was talk in Europe and they've said, well, you know, the European farmers can carry on for another 18 months. It's not, the science hasn't been proven. And then there's been the issue of uh, talking about um, glyphosate causing cancer. And, uh, and so one state in America actually produces a, um, a list of chemicals that are potentially carcinogenic. And um, Monsanto have taken umbrage to that, uh, to that state, and they're actually taking the state to court and saying, this is unfounded, untrue, and it's, glyphosate should not be on that list. So um, it, it actually was originally registered as a detergent by Stauffer. So it wasn't actually as a herbicide, <laughs> the detergent. So, um, oh, right. <laughs> yes, it, it, so that's why Stauffer don't have the uh, ownership of, of Roundup as a herbicide, because they registered it as a detergent. So it looks like a detergent and it does foam up. But <laughs> I don't suggest, uh, it's probably a very expensive form of detergent. Yeah. What's FAR up to, the Foundation for Arable Research? Well, Foundation for Arable Research are, are advertising for um, graduates to apply for their, um, their sponsorship program. And uh, they, they've had some very good ones go through um, the system. And they need a degree in, uh, in science or, or ag science or ag commerce um, to apply but they, they offer a um, competitive salary. And of course, those graduates rub shoulders with some of the top um, agronomists and top uh, researchers, not only in New Zealand, Australia, but around the world. And so it's a, a fantastic learning experience mm. if you do get their scholarship. So um, look to, to FAR to, um, to further your knowledge and, and career. Absolutely, career, yes. yeah, yeah, indeed. Mm. Club route. Yes, Rob, um, brassicas, uh, it's a bit like sort of um, take all in wheat. If you start getting growing brassicas too closely together, you can get a disease called club root. And um, it, it looks very much like leprosy in the, in the root system of a, of a, um, of a brassica. And it, it, Syngenta have developed a canola, which is club root resistant. Well, there's not many brassicas at all in the world that are but certainly it, it can stay in the soil for many, many years too. So some brassicas succumb completely to it and um, don't produce. Others will tolerate it a bit. But if you looked at the root system, it looks like leprosy and it's, it's, it, it's shocking. But uh, there's some hope on the horizon that the breeders have, uh, are doing something. Goody. And very briefly, you've got a bit of a message for handling seed with kid gloves. Absolutely. Well, just think of seed. It's an embryo with a coat on the outside of it. So be very, very gentle on how you treat seed. And that includes um, rolling it, squashing it, bouncing it on hard surfaces, um, drying it too quickly, uh, getting moisture on it where, where the seed coat will move in and out because there's a little embryo in there. And once you've damaged that, um, your seed will not grow. And of course it won't grow, nobody will buy it. So <laughs> exactly. just, just think of it as like an, a baby in the womb, it's an embryo, look after it. Exactly, thank you very much indeed, Dennis. In just a moment, we're gonna be once again talking Holstein Frisians. Dennis, looking at the, the breed, is it pretty strong worldwide? Um, it's still looking pretty, pretty strong. Um, uh, we're right up there with um, all the other breeds. We've uh, got a very strong world network and um, it's yeah, it's looking it's looking good, but we're all the time looking to make some small tweaks, some small changes. Yeah. Obviously, in New Zealand, it is the black and whites with a few extras. Is that the same for other countries like well, Australia and perhaps South America? Yes, it's very much the same in South America. Um, black and whites and a few others. Um, it's quite the yeah, they're quite strong in, in both Australia. There's still some other minor breeds that, um, they say have their purpose, but black and whites are the strongest, yes. You, you changed the size a wee bit when you're using a bit of American blood. Are you happy with what you've got now? Um, I think um, we've got American blood in the background of most of the bulls in New Zealand, but um, New Zealand system suits the smaller cow 
um, because we're outdoors, still 95% is still outdoors. So, um, yeah, we have um, used American blood, but we've got to be careful that we don't get too big. We're swinging now, whether we like it or not, into barns. Is, that's the, the future, do you think? Um, no, I don't think it'll be the future. I think when milk solids price was up around that 7 to $8, it certainly was feasible. But I think now you're going to see a pretty major halt to the barn system and uh, we'll be reverting to all grass uh, again um, with the barns being used to a, my, a, a lesser extent. Nutrition is very important. Yes, in bale feeding, uh, and of course we've always um, had the use of palm kernel extract, and um, in Canterbury here we've got the use of um, the grains, uh, which is, uh, yeah, that's good to add to the, the grass farming, but um, I think that anything further than that, which regards greater expense, is going to be, we'll see a reduction in, in that. And Dennis, it will come back. Um, we hope. <laughs> we, yeah, of course we all hope, but uh, the recovery from what I can gather, in, in, being at the World Conference in Argentina and, and the World Classification Workshop, we had 29 countries there. They are all saying that their production, particularly Europe, is going to be still increasing, along with the government helping them with the subsidies. Um, we're going to be, we're in for a long haul here. It's not going to be a quick uh, reversal in prices. So the bottom line is that if you've got some really good cows, you can really sort of work on that top percentage. Yeah, and, we, and that's what we've always done. And I think the big thing is to keep, encourage people and young people to keep doing it and have faith and do it and keep doing that. Um, we're always looking to improve and we're always looking for new genetics, um, especially outside the genetics that we're using, yeah, just to give us some fresh blood. But yeah, they try and keep it up. And as far as the top studs in the country are concerned, I guess it's a case of listening to them and learning from them. Oh yeah, yeah. We've got to keep watching what the uh, top guys are doing. Um, the, you know, particularly in terms of profit, we've had quite a bit of an emphasis over the last ten years uh, in New Zealand on production, but unfortunately we've slipped back on the emphasis on making a profit, and this is where we've got to swing it to. And after the break, we're going to be talking insurance and what these agents really do get as form of payment. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things. Make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. Everybody has a story to tell. What's yours? Maybe your family has been farming the land for five generations. Perhaps you have invented the next best thing in agriculture, or maybe something else. Whatever your story, if you're out on the land, we want to hear from you. Get in touch by emailing us at info at ontheland.co.nz.
Insurance Advisors Secret 340k Lives. Hank. Yes, well, I'd like to know where they get that figure from because it certainly not, doesn't reflect in my bank account. <laughs> um, I think in terms of that particular article, there are, there are some things viewers need to understand about that. And the first one is the term churn. Um, it's used frequently in the industry as an industry term for where advisors shift their clients from one insurance company to another for no real apparent reason or benefit to the client. And there's often an assumption then that they're doing that to regenerate their income or, to, or for their remuneration. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen, and it can happen. Um, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that a client should not look at what's available in the marketplace. And if as their circumstances change, then they should look at where the best policies for their circumstances are. If that means changing suppliers, then that is exactly what they should do. So how often, Barbara Lee, should we actually talk to somebody like yourselves and say, well, we need to update? Well, you know, I mean, when, when you buy a house, um, you know, you don't expect to possibly live in that house for life, do you? You expect to upgrade as your life changes. And it's the same thing with your policies. Policies change over time, policy wordings change, and we need to make sure that if there's a claim, that they're going to get the best possible outcome at claim time. Um, I mean, I had a client who, because he had a very, very old policy, uh, his policy wording meant that he didn't meet the claim definition. Whereas if he had had a, had a regular review, review mm. with us, we would have um, looked at what he had. And if he was medically able to move to another policy, that's definitely what we would have recommended. Mm. So how often should we review? Oh, every 12 months is great. Um, two years the maximum. Uh, any time that you've got a change in your life, you know, a change of occupation, uh, you've moved house, uh, you might have stopped had smoking, had children. Divorced. Any, <laughs> yes, yes, that's a big one, you know. Mm. So all those moments in life we need to stop and just have a look and see if everything still suits our needs. And it's our role to make sure that if there's something there that's going to be to the client's betterment, then it's our, our duty to uh, tell them about that. Hank, let's go back to that article because it is a perception mm -hmm. they actually hit a button for a lot of people yep. overseas trips as an incentive to put my life insurance into a different company uh, yeah there are certain incentives that life insurance uh, companies put in place for those that uh, achieve um, levels of business if you like um, it's like any other sales incentive you know the insurance isn't, industry isn't unique to that there are a number of industries that incentivize through what we call uh, soft dollar commissions it's a reward that's that's given to a degree on hard work if that makes sense um, we get paid uh, because we do business if we do nothing we get nothing um, so there is to a degree, uh, like in any commission sales, what we term the 80-20 the rule, where 80% where of the business is written by 20% of the people that are out there doing the business, uh, similar to a lot of commission sales. So should we get rewarded? Is it an incentive? It's, it's, it's there. Um, will that make a difference to a lot of advisors on where they, where they place their business? I don't think so, certainly not for the prudent advisors. Mm. We've said it before on this program, you know, we're business people, we rely on clients, we rely on clients to produce more business for us and to continue our business. Um, if we get an extra reward for being good at what we do, so be it, that's, that, that's there. But does it dictate what we do? I don't think so. Comes back, I guess, to your comment about the fact that you sit down with somebody and you don't even think of the product until you've worked out their needs. That's exactly it. Yep, exactly it. So you don't go in with the preconceived idea that these people are going to be buying that company. No, that's right. No, it totally depends on the client. And you know, if you're out there and you haven't maybe seen somebody about the policies that you've had in place, well, you know, get in touch with Hank and I. We're happy to come out and show you through your options and just check that because everything people does could well be in the wrong one. Absolutely. And that's, you know, at claim time is, you know, where you want to be in the right, the right policy that's going to give you the best outcome. Hank, is there an overall body that controls insurance advisors? And if, if they do fall off the line a wee bit, that they can be bounced? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, since the Financial Advisors Act came into, into being, there was the Financial Markets Authority, which is essentially the, the police, if you like, of the, of the financial services industry. And a lot of this article was, 
was about uh, how the Financial Markets Authority are taking a, a closer look at advisors that on a regular or disturbing number of, of, of changes from one company to another. So yes, very definitely, and they have the authority to be able to act. So if somebody is doing what this article was suggesting, uh, they can have their license, for the want of a better term, taken off them? Yeah, they can. There are certain, there are certain aspects that, that uh, um, the, the Financial Markets Authority have. However, we're still governed by other um, statutes. We're still governed by uh, you know, the Consumer Guarantees Act. We're yep. still governed by the Fair Trading Act. We're still governed by the Crimes Act. And I can tell you now, there are advisors who are serving terms of imprisonment uh, because they acted outside of the, of the Crimes Act. They committed fraud. Um, so, yeah, there are lots of other enactments and there are lots of other policemen out there. So, you know, we need to act within the law. We need to act ethically and mm. professionally. Um, and, you know, our business won't survive. Our industry won't survive unless we do that. You've rest re restored my faith. <laughs> thank you both very much oh, indeed. You. And we've got more for you on the land in just a moment or two. Kerry, enterprising women. Yes, of course, Rural Women New Zealand, as they do every year, have now opened again their Enterprising Rural Women Awards for women in business in the rural sector. Um, those awards are open now until the end of August for people to apply. Um, with the three categories, they've got um, inspiring business and community leaders, um, the, the traditional on the land type businesses, you know, if you're in agriculture, horticulture or tourism, and also um, use of technology if you're a, a business um, creating software for the, the rural sector. Um, there's a section there for you. So we're encouraging women to, who are in business um, to look at those awards and, and um, have a go, you know, put an application in. It's, it's a great process, you know. A lot of um, businesses who've been through it in the past say the process is fantastic. Apart from promoting their business, they also get the opportunity to really take a step back and, and just have a think about their business, what they're wanting to achieve, where they're going, what their goals are for the next few years. And they've said the process is just as important as whether they do or don't win. And of course, there's some amazing prizes too. In many of these events, you actually learn more from the judges than you, than you give, away, give out. I think so. I think there's that opportunity because with the judges, you have that chance to really discuss and talk about your business, but to present it and uh, People say they learn a lot about their business that they hadn't really thought about before. They've been, you know, you, you trudge along and in, in, in doing what you do and then you have this chance to step back and really have a good look at where you're going and what you're hoping to achieve and how far you've come. And, and that's a great process for people. So I'd really encourage people to, to have a look at that as an opportunity. There'll be those who will say, I just want to be humble and I don't want to be a tall poppy. Well, there are those who think, oh no, I'd never, I'd never be good enough. You know, my business wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't qualify for that. But I'd, I'd still encourage you to try. Um, because even if you, you're not a winner, it's the process of, of looking at your business and the business planning that goes into it and the chance to, to discuss that with other people and, and get another insight into what you're doing. I think people have found that really, really valuable just as much as being whether a winner or not. You apply online? Yes, you do. All the information and the application forms are on um, the Rural Woman website. So you can easily go on there and click them and print them off and, and it'll tell you exactly what you need to do to apply. And other people who know somebody who's in business, yes. lean on them. Absolutely. Encourage them and, and um, uh, encourage chase them, them chase them along and get them to do that because I think it's well worth it. Teenagers and driving, it's always a subject, isn't it? It is, it is, and it's something I've sort of had a bit to do with lately. I've been sort of trying to get my own children through it. Um, but it's, it's woken me up to a few things that as parents we sometimes don't think about, and um, the common sense things, you know, it's great. We all know our kids, so sometimes they might have been ticking around the farm and the farm track, and we all think, yeah, they know what they're doing, but they probably don't. And we know that the teenage brain doesn't work particularly well, <laughs> um, particularly when they're behind the wheel of a car. And it's just simple things like making sure that when they've got their, their new car, they actually know basic things if it's going to break down, you know, how to change the tyre and actually make sure they can actually physically do it. That because should be part of the It of should be. You know, there's, there's a great difference between knowing how to do it and being able to do it. And particularly for, for a lot of young folk, um, you know, it takes a fair bit of strength to shift those wheel nuts at times. So make sure they know, because on rural roads that happens, you know, make sure they know how to get it started and how to jump start it, all those basic things. And, and even for um, basic car maintenance, you know, 
when does it need a service? All those, you know, what do you need to do and watching for the oil levels and all those yeah. basic things that we take as common sense, but we don't think to teach to our youngsters. Tire pressures. Tire pressures, all those things. And also for rural people, um, making sure they know how to drive on a shingle road because it's so different to driving on a tar seal road. And as we know, um, particularly in winter, those road surfaces change very quickly and they go from being a nice simple shingle road to being quite a slippery, muddy thing. And, you know, a lot of young folk don't really know how to drive safely at speed on a shingle road. And so, you know, real common sense stuff that keeps your kids safe. Most of the, uh, it's probably males more than young females, but they're bulletproof. All teenagers are bulletproof. They all think it's never going to happen to them. Um, and so they all probably drive a bit too fast, take risks. They don't think clearly. They're too busy worrying about where they're going, who they're going to meet up with, what they're going to be doing. Or texting. Texting when they shouldn't be, of course. But, um, you know, the teenage brain doesn't work properly. They don't think about the risks the same as you and I might. The other thing that I would really encourage people to do is make sure that with your teenagers' phones, they haven't just got the contacts from the... 500 kids at school plus a heap of people that don't really know, as kids do. But they've got contacts in there for mum and dad, um, friends and neighbours who could come and help them if they get stuck. Because quite often kids don't have those contacts in their phone. You know, who are they going to ring if they break down and they can't get hold of mum and dad? You know, even the AA, sign them up with an AA membership. You know, just simple things that are going to help them and keep them safe on the road. Because the other thing is that somebody who's been driving for as long as you and I can drive quickly because we can, we know. We've got the experience yes. and you know what you're doing, whereas mm. we forget that our young folk don't have that, that years of experience. And even if they've been driving the ute around the farm, it's totally different to driving on the road. So I think just apply a little bit of common sense, help get your teenagers well prepared. Indeed, Kerry, very good advice. Thank you very much indeed. Still to come on the programme, we're going to be talking about young farmers with Terry Copeland and also finding out what Holstein Frisian cows are worth when we visit a sale. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Everybody has a story to tell. What's yours? Maybe your family has been farming the land for five generations. Perhaps you have invented the next best thing in agriculture. Or maybe something else. Whatever your story, if you're out on the land, we want to hear from you. Get in touch by emailing us at info at ontheland.co.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. So tell us about the 100 years of the breed. The New Zealand Holstein Frisian Association has been going for 100 years. Well, in 2010 it had been going for 100 years, and in 2016 this year is the 100 year anniversary for the Canterbury Westland branch. So um, there's a lot of the best cows in New Zealand uh, based in Canterbury Westland, and uh, we actually only recently found out, like in the last couple of weeks, that it was there hundredth year so it's quite timely that we are hosting the annual conference in Canterbury this year. Um, I guess uh, over the hundred years things have changed a lot like the herds would have been so much smaller than nowadays there would have been a, a far larger number of herds but lo a lot less cows in each herd whereas nowadays the herds you know in Canterbury especially probably average like four or five hundred cows in a herd. Uh, maybe not so much with the uh, uh, pedigree Holstein Frisians, but the herds are still a lot larger than they used to be. 
And where do you think the breed may go in the next 100 years? Well, I'd like to think it's uh, pretty positive. We are the, um, well, I believe and all the rest of us uh, here believe that we are the best breed in New Zealand. Uh, we're very efficient producers of protein and uh, bigger frame cows so we can uh, do more per cow production. We don't have to stack as many cows on per hectare. And then uh, I guess another small positive is that the cull cows, once they've uh, done their time in the herds, they're worth a lot more too, just because they're so much bigger and, and way more when they kill out. And are the black and white still the major breed in New Zealand, the major player? Well, we believe so, but uh, s some other people probably would beg to differ. Uh, it's all personal preference, I guess. Tell us about the black and white youth movement. Uh, it's always great to see. There's a lot of uh, children sort of work their way up. You know, from a young age, they uh, get interested in showing and going to youth camps and that sort of thing. And, you know, over the years, they just naturally progress through and and uh, then some of them will end up going uh, contract milking, shear milking or uh, back to the family farm and uh, yeah it's just always really re re rewarding seeing the young people uh, develop. Is showing at the A&P shows still an important thing for the breeders to do? Uh, yes it is. Uh, a lot of the uh, breeders, uh, you know, they put a lot of time into showing and uh, while they might not take as big a teams to the shows as they used to, they still put a lot of effort in and they, uh, the cows that they show are, you know, of extremely high quality and very well prepared. And um, it's, a, it's a really great environment amongst all the breeders. They're very supportive of e supportive and encouraging of each other, you know, like... Uh, it, if they get beaten, they will still be, in, you know, in a, a class or a champion care, they'll still be, um, they'll be pleased for the winner, even though they've missed out. You know, it's a, it's a very encouraging organisation to be involved in. And why are you so passionate about the Holstein breed? Well, uh, all of us as breeders, we just know we've got the best breed of cows in New Zealand. Um, you know, the the most productive per cow, and. Uh, therefore lead on to being more profitable. They produce large quantities of protein, which is uh, worth far higher value than the milk fat component of uh, milk solids as well. So uh, all, all in all, you know, like we do get re rewarded for the um, better quality milk, so to speak, that the Holstein Friesian Care uh, breeds in the payout system. You've had a great turnout for the sale. Uh, has the sale day met your expectations? Uh, yeah, we're certainly very pleased with the turnout today and uh, I guess with the tough economic climate it was a, very much an unknown of uh, how the sale was going to go today but um, overall like the uh, upper end of the sale has been very pleasing. It probably struggled a little bit with some of the um, uh, prices for the uh, lower price lots but all in all it seems to be going pretty well really considering. Here's an opportunity to buy a heifer out of the heart of the best cow family of Jacobs in Quebec, Canada. She's by Wenbrook, one of the high-rated bulls of the world. She has that tremendous Wenbrook strength and capacity and then put her out of a Sid. Sid being the premier sire World Dairy Expo last year and then the next day in the Goldwyn, the many-time winner at the Royal Winter Fair World Dairy Expo. Look at the photos in the catalogue, I'm sure you have. But ladies and gentlemen, the full sister of the dam in North America in Jacob's Sid Beauty has to be considered one of the hottest cows ever in North America. If you want others, you want the whole package, we can't offer you much more than lot four. <laughs> Ready to go. Beautiful ever. By golly, I want her to make close when you tell me she'll make 15,000 to buy her. Here you go, 15,000 to start her. Let's go auction. Give me 10 and go. I'll be 10,000 to buy her. 10 to start her. You tell me she'll make 8,000 to buy her. Who can give me five? I'll be 5,000 to buy her. You know she'll make it. 5,000 to buy her. Well, give me four and go. I'll be 4,000 to buy her. Well, I've got 3,000 to be with the world. It'll be three. It'll be 3,000 to be. Now, here we go. I'll be three. I'm going to be thinking about it now, and I'll be three. The money done. I've got 3,000 to be. Now, three. I'm going to be 4,000 to be. Now, four. I'm going to be 4,000 to be down there, and I'll be four to go with you now, and I'll be four. The money mixed bit. 
I got 4,000 to be now, let the word yeah. 5,000 on the call, Richard Leach, and I'll be 5,000 yeah. to be now, 6,000 on the call, be 6,000 of money down. I'm calling 6 of it out on the right hand side, another 6,000 of it, you're all gone in front, another 6 of money down. Here's an opportunity to buy the very, very best, and I'll be 6,000 dollars, and I'm part of that, 6,000 of money down, bitch down here. I got 6,000 dollars done, I'll be 6,000 of tail, I'll take your 500 if you like, and I got 6,000 dollars done. Yeah. He said 500 now, Richard, and I'll be 6,500, 7,000, I'll be 7 of early down. I got 7,000 dollars, I'll stay in 500 all the way, and I've been 7 of money, you got to like the way she's made, and I've been 7 of money done. Here's an opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, buy out of the heart of one of the greatest herds of cows in North America. Yeah. 500, I've got to be 75 out of the bed done. I'm calling Richard Leach and I've been 75 out of you all gone down here, Mick, and I've been 75 out of the money done. I got 7,005 out of the bed, not part of that. It's opportunity time, and I've been 75 out of the money down here. I got 7,500 once. I've been 7,500 twice. The bid's on the Richard Leach call. And everybody this way has gone. And I'm on 75 out of the money. Not part of you think about artists. You think about capacity. You think about a big, well-grown heifer. Here she is. And I'm on 7,500. 8,000 is new blood. And I'll stay in 500s all the way, Richard, if you like. But I'm calling Dick. And I got $8,000. I have an 8,000 of money. I'm part of that. I got 8,000 of it. Now, here's your opportunity once. I got 8,000 twice. Third and final bid at $8,000. Who's in charge down there? I got 8,000 of money. I sell it once. 500. Dick, it's your turn. I'm on 85 out of the money. Richard leads his bid. I got 85 out of the money. I'm part of once. I got 8,000. 500 twice. Third and final call. Hold on at 8,000. 500 of the money. I sell. Done. Hold on at 85 out of the money. Be quick. And I sell. So, indeed, she does go to buy number nine, isn't it? Indeed, the Flay family, and they know the cattle very, very well. And she'll do great You've had a busy week know. with the sale and the conference here in Canterbury. Tell us a bit about the conference. Uh, so, it's run from uh, the first delegate started arriving on uh, Sunday evening, and uh, we've had uh, herd, herd visits down around uh, Timaru and Tamuka on uh, Monday, and then uh, yesterday it was... Uh, a couple of herds out a hoke away and then the uh, bus trip went up to Oxford for lunch and then through the gorge and out to a farm at Bankside and then on to uh, another farm at Tahora. And uh, we've had uh, presentation evenings each night and, and then today we've had a uh, uh, herd visit to Creslands and then uh, uh, my farm and then on to the sale here. So. Uh, if you'd asked us three or four weeks ago, we were pretty nervous about the number of registrations, but we've ended up uh, reasonably pleased, all things considered, uh, with the number of delegates that have attended. And uh, luckily enough, Canterbury's put on an awesome week of weather. And we've, uh, as far as I'm aware, we've really only had positive feedback. So it's been a lot of uh, compliments, so that's great. Yeah, and it just gives the opportunity for uh, you know, local breeders to uh, show off their herd that we wouldn't, uh, you know, like some of us don't show that much, so um, our, our herds don't get, and studs don't get exposed that much, but uh, by um, having the herd visits, so a lot more breeders get the opportunity to promote their herd, and, and also it gives the delegates the opportunity to view um, some of our good cows that they wouldn't otherwise get the opportunity. major focus for your young farmer of the year. Yeah, that's right. It's rolled around really quickly. But it yeah. has. You blew me away when yeah. you said it was this week. This week in Timaru. Yep. In fact, half my team have gone down today to start the set up and it starts on Thursday. But yeah, the FMG Young Farmer of the Year is uh, pretty important on our calendar. So the top echelon, how's the mix? Yeah, good. And it's um, quite divergent this year. We've got three dairy farmers, three sheep and beef farmers and a rural professional. So it's anyone's game. The rural professional, that's nice because it's not somebody off the land. Yeah, that's right. Well, he's got a rural background, of course. But, uh, yeah, he works for um, PGG Rights and he's our Waikato Bay of Plenty finalist. So, yeah. You said it starts Thursday and it goes through until Saturday, Saturday night. Yep. So there's stages. Yeah, in fact, it just make life really difficult for us. We have 28 different events over those three days. Oh, nice. So, yes, we have a, a, a cast of thousands. You, know, you obviously don't write the script. No, not me personally. <laughs> but uh, no, we're lucky we have um, probably 150 volunteers that help out for the week, as well as my staff. And uh, it's great to be in, in uh, South Canterbury too. It's, it's been 14 years since the grand, grand final in South Canterbury. So, yeah, really exciting. 
You've got the top layer, but then you've got two layers below that. Yeah, which I'm personally really invested in. Uh, the the AgriKids and Teen Ag finals that, that we run side by side, you, you know, they can see each other's events. Uh, so the AgriKids, uh, the competitors started eight years old, and you can really see the passion starting to grow. The Teen Ag competition, which is for high school students, um, we've really upped the game this year, and it's a mini Young Farmers Grand Final. It's tough, it's got all the elements, the academic, yes, the physical, the challenging uh, technical components. Yeah, so we're really trying to lift it so that 16, 17, 18 year olds can go straight into the Young Farmer of the Year without feeling that they're completely uh, out of touch. So it's the old story of intermediate school before high school. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we, and we want competitors to come in a bit younger and more keen and, you know, give it a real thrash early on. And that enthusiasm, you can feel it when you're talking to, to the different yeah, groups? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I make a point too of going around some high schools and primary schools after uh, our events just to see how the schools got on and, and you really see that passion growing year by year. I remember last year that the, the finalists who, you know, the winners of the, I call them the sort of the lower grades, and, and they were so well back into it, you know, it was, it is, it's really taken hold. Yeah, and, you know, for the agri kids this year, we had nearly 600 kids across the country take part, and that, that's great because, you know, the more... Yeah, that's the titlers, isn't it? Yes, absolutely, and uh, although in saying that, I remember last year, I think it was, um, one of the agri kids fin grand finals was taller than I am, you know, and they're 12 years old. It's a bit frightening, really. <laughs> Just, you don't want to go back there and start playing <laughs> league, do you? Know? And you've obviously, the field day is up in Hamilton. That's another big area for PR for you. Yeah, and we did something a bit different this year. The National Field Days at Mystery Creek organisation approached us early in the year to sort of coordinate a, an education and career hub. So they gave us a building, a 488 square metre building to work out of, uh, to really promote careers and agriculture and education. And we, we got involved um, growing New Zealand, we got involved uh, a number of key industry players to help us out, so Dairy NZ, Primary ITO, um, to really showcase what's available for young people to get into a career and further their education outside of what you'd normally think traditionally you would do, like going to Lincoln and Massey and doing an agriculture degree, which of course is very important. Um, but we need marketers, we need people who are going to do engineering degrees. You know, Fonterra is the largest employer of engineers in New Zealand, yet most people who think about engineering wouldn't think about Fonterra. So it's just sort of pushing those um, large stories of what's available out there for young people. And, if you, and you know, as I say, if you want to do engineering, brilliant, we need you. So how do we engage earlier and, and with a wider group? So farming is starting to get sexy. Yeah, it is. And if you look at the amount of technology, the amount of research being done, uh, I went to the Federated Farmers National Conference last week in Wellington and Sir Peter Gluckman spoke about there is such a need for more R&D in agricultural science so that farming can actually take that next step and be competitive from a technological point of view, not just from a low-cost pastoral farming point of view, which we've already seen some inroads being taken by other countries. So the more we can adopt technology, as we know, it's young people that are the early adopters, the drivers behind being really interested in how we apply precision agriculture to the next step. How do we, how do we get uh, even more understanding of technology so that um, the advances that we make are going to benefit the whole economy, not just that individual farm? Well, look what IT's done to the industry. Oh, exactly. And, you know, I, I am very fortunate I get to speak to the communications minister quite often. And Minister Adams, being a farmer herself, knows the value of having broadband throughout New Zealand so that we can take advantage of this technology. Uh, it's very frustrating, it's still taking a bit of time. But there is a commitment, I think, to make it happen. We're just going to make sure that we push. So some young person who wants to do IT can actually get in part, in part of our industry. Yeah, and, and it's a lack of knowledge and, and perception of our industry too. So one of the projects that we've done this year is we've developed uh, a network at Otago University with the Commerce School, uh, working with marketing students to say, look, let's, let's look at all the opportunities in food marketing that you might get involved in and introduce you to people in industry. And then all of a sudden we've got these people who've come into Otago University, not from a rural background, doing marketing going, wow, food's really cool. I could see myself working for an ANSCO or a Fonterra and they wouldn't have before. So the more we can start to showcase career options and opportunities, then the audience that we talk to widens, the whole economy benefits. We're right behind you, Terry. Thank you very much indeed. If you'd like to see more, or once again have a look at Terry's interview or any of the other ones that are on the programme, go to our website. It's ontheland.co.nz. I'm Rob Cope-Williams. You've either been just listening to Terry 
or you just missed him. But I will be back at the same time next week. Until then, bye now.